Public transportation is an integral part of a lot of cities worldwide. Even if you personally don't want to, or can't use it, the existence of the option to take transit brings numerous benefits. In this video, we'll explore the numerous benefits of providing a comprehensive, efficient, and affordable public transport system. Before the video starts, please consider subscribing. It's free and it helps out a ton. Thanks and on to the video. Providing quality public transport services brings numerous economic benefits. First, using public transportation is almost always cheaper than driving. According to Numbeo.com, which provides data on the cost of living in countries around the world, a monthly public transit pass is the most expensive in New Zealand. On average, a monthly public transport pass in the country costs 200.1 New Zealand dinars or 120.38 US dollars. To get the costs of owning a car, I had to do some digging. After doing that, I landed on this website of a New Zealand-based car insurance company. To get a reasonably average quote, I put the car as a 2020 Toyota Corolla sedan, the driver as a 30-year-old man living in a suburb of the capital city, Auckland. With these details, I received a quote of 1,524.14 New Zealand rupees, or about 917 US dollars per year. This comes up to about 76.4 US dollars per month. That means that just car insurance, for a comparatively small car, costs 63.4% of the price for a month of unlimited public transport usage, in the capital of the country with the most expensive monthly public transport pass. That price completely ignores the other costs of car ownership, such as maintenance, depreciation, gas, tolls, and more. The problem with Auckland's and many other cities' public transport systems is the lack of funding, and by proxy, the subpar frequency, availability, and quality of service. Underfunding transit leads to a vicious cycle. Budget cuts to public transport cause the quality of service to drop, which leads to less ridership, which leads to lower revenue, which leads to more budget cuts, and repeat. The direct costs aren't the only way that car centrism is bleeding us dry, faster than Elon Musk with Twitter. Car-centric infrastructure is also super expensive to build and maintain. Staying in New Zealand, maintaining a kilometer, or 0.6 miles of state highway costs 20,000 Kiwi bucks, or about 12,000 US dollars per year. The costs don't end there. Once a motorist gets to their destination and parks their car, in most cases, they are the recipient of another subsidy. According to Strong Towns, a non-profit organization advocating for better urban planning, parking subsidies cost countries and cities billions of dollars per year. Because of these factors, the vast majority of trips in the city of Auckland are made by cars. According to the latest model share split study from 2018, only 12% of the trips made in the city were by public transportation. In contrast, a whopping 81% of trips were made by private cars. To be honest, I don't blame people for driving if there aren't any viable options. Even I, a public transport enthusiast and proponent, would drive if it meant that I would get to my destination in 15 minutes instead of 2 hours. The problem isn't with driving and drivers themselves, it's with our car-centric urban planning and transit policy. If people want to drive, sure, but we shouldn't force everyone to drive, and we shouldn't subsidize drivers at the scale we do now. All these costs could be lowered with strategic investments in quality public transport service. However, there is one more, less talked about economic impact of public transport investment, and that's the impact on the local economy. Look at a place like this. This is just some random suburb of Houston, Texas that I've picked out on a map. It's practically a desert, devoid of anything resembling economic activity. Of course, cities are more than their economies, but they have to sustain their numerous services somehow. In comparison, investment in public transport can drive economic development in numerous ways. Firstly, a transit line provides stable, outsourcing-proof employment for members of the local community. Secondly, various studies show that public transport stations increase the land value of surrounding land by providing greater accessibility to that region. Thirdly, Less cars on the road as a consequence of higher transit usage leads to lower healthcare costs through cleaner air and less injuries and deaths from car crashes. And finally, the land around public transport stops can be developed into transit-oriented development, 
which can become incredibly lively and economically productive land due to transit promoting density, walkability, and discouraging car use. The positive impact of public transport doesn't end at economic benefits. Now, let's look at the social impact. A developed country is not a place where the poor have cars, it's where the rich use public transportation. Gustavo Petro, President of Colombia. I agree with this quote 100% for multiple reasons. First of all, a robust public transport system encourages intermingling of all ethnicities, social classes, and backgrounds. From my personal experience of riding Prague public transit, I can attest that everyone, from the working class and students, all the way to business owners and CEOs takes transit here, because it's usually the cheapest and a solidly efficient way to get somewhere. In contrast, while driving a car, everyone is scooped up inside their own little climate-controlled bubbles, which makes it really easy to completely isolate yourself from other people. This is also why society, especially in North America, seems so atomized and lonely. When you stop and think about it, people in car-centric cities don't interact with each other as much. Picture this. You live on a street like this. You have your own little suburban dream, a white picket fence, a big lawn covered in so many military-grade chemicals that would make Monsanto blush, and a massive detached house, heating and cooling which requires its own mini nuclear reactor. Every morning, you wake up, do your morning routine, and go to work. You get in your car and head for work. After arriving at work, you park your car and head to your workplace. Over that entire period, you barely interacted with and saw other people. The most you've seen are the taillights of other cars, with the rare pedestrian or cyclist. In comparison, if you live somewhere like here and take transit to work, you would see and interact with far more people on your daily commute. Overall, public transportation reduces social atomization and encourages social cohesion. Second of all, Access to transportation is the single most important factor determining a person's ability to escape poverty. After all, if you can't get to work, school, activities, and more, you'll have a hard time escaping poverty. As previously mentioned, relying on cars is a fine way to make society more atomized and poorer, and so we could turn to public transport. Providing affordable, reliable, and widespread public transport makes sure that everyone regardless of social status, can get to places. Third of all, public transport is inclusive of all social groups. Again, let's go back to that suburb in Houston. If you live somewhere like this, you have to drive to get anywhere. The problem with that is that not everyone can drive. If you're under the legal driving age, if you are too old, if you have a medical issue that prevents you from driving, you are unable to participate in society on your own, and have to rely on others to basically be your personal Uber driver. Even if you are able to drive, car dependency bars you from doing certain activities independently. If you want to go to a bar, or to a cannabis dispensary if you live somewhere where it is legal, you would have to call an expensive taxi, select a person to be the designated driver, or take the product home before consuming. Again, investment in public transport can mitigate these issues. There isn't a minimum or maximum age for taking transit, you can take it even if you are visually impaired, and you can take it even if you are under the influence. There is one more positive aspect of public transport, the environmental impact. Public transport can positively affect the environment in numerous ways. Firstly, transit infrastructure usually takes up less space than roads and parking lots, and is usually less disruptive than car infrastructure. For an example of this, we can take a short trip to Angel in Prague, Czech Republic. This is Angel, the busiest tram stop slash interchange in the city. Up to 80,000 people pass through here on a regular day. Even though this place is a busy transport interchange, it's bustling with life, with loads of pedestrian traffic. There is no need for zebra crossings and stoplights for pedestrians, as both tram and foot traffic mix smoothly. In contrast, roads and parking lots physically take up more space and usually don't mix well with foot traffic, creating the need for zebra crossings and stoplights for pedestrians. Secondly, public transport usage usually brings cleaner air as a consequence of less exhaust fumes and tire particles from cars being released into the air. 
According to measurements of particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide taken all over the city, a street called Lagerova had the highest concentration of these undesirable materials in the air. What I am sure is completely coincidental, the street is located on the Severojni Magistrala, a car sewer right in the middle of the city. Another, less talked about aspect of public transport infrastructure are the comparatively low average noise levels. While it's true that when directly compared, an individual bus, train or tram will make more noise than an individual car due to the increased weight of the vehicles, we need to look further. First of all, an individual public transport vehicle carries way more people than a single car. Second of all, car traffic produces constant noise, whereas public transport traffic only produces noise in intervals, as trains, buses and trams only come at designated intervals. Third of all, Public transport traffic is usually relegated to certain corridors, making planning around the potential noise easier. For example, noise barriers can be installed along lots of rail routes, or grass can be planted around tram tracks to decrease the noise generated from their wheels. In contrast, installing noise barriers would be more difficult for car traffic, since installing them on city streets would be less than ideal. Measures can be taken to reduce the noise from car traffic without noise barriers, such as paving roads with porous asphalt, but these measures would still have to be taken on a lot of roads to provide any significant impact. In conclusion, strategic investments in and planning around public transit could bring numerous benefits to cities. From making the residents wealthier, to raising the air quality, to increasing social cohesion, public transit can make an already good city even better. Anyways, Thank you so much for watching to the end, you're a real legend. If you want to check out the equipment I use to make these videos, I've put some affiliate links in the description. Using these links will directly support the channel, so using them would be greatly appreciated. Enjoy the bloopers, this has been Tremly and I'll see you next time. Bye! To get a reasonably average quote, I put the car as a 2020 Toyota Corolla sedan, the driver as a 30 year old- <coughs> To get a reasonably average quote, I put the car as a 2020 Toyota Corolla sedan, the driver as a 30 year old man, living in a zo- <coughs> Fuck. That means that just car insurance, for a comparatively small car, costs 60 <coughs> If people want to drive, sure, but we for- <coughs> Another, less talked about aspect of public transport infrastructure are the <sighs> Measures can be taken to reduce the noise from car traffic without noise barriers such as paving roads with porous asphalt. But these measures... <coughs>